On this episode of the Resilient Advisor Podcast, I have the chance to interview Susan Bradley of the Sudden Money Institute. She is also the creator of the Certified Financial Transition Specialist designation. Behavioral finance has become a very popular topic in our industry, and Susan has a different take on the subject matter. She believes that there is a dark side to behavioral finance, and we walk through her thought process. She also generously offers to give away 10 copies of her transition journal to the first 10 folks who respond to the offer inside the podcast and in the show notes. I also want to thank Ross Marino of Recon Intelligence for making the introduction to Susan that made this podcast possible. I hope you enjoy. Thanks for downloading this episode of the Resilient Advisor Podcast. My name is Jay Coulter. I am a self-admitted behavioral finance nerd. I love the academic lens on why we make the financial decisions that we do. My guest today is going to present a different lens on this subject. She believes that there is a dark side to behavioral finance. Joining me is Susan Bradley, who is the founder of the Sudden Money Institute, which is a think tank that was created that has created the financial the certified financial transitionist designation for 16 years Susan has been training financial advisors in the unique processes and tools that the institute created for managing the human dynamics of financial change she is a certified financial planner and serves on the FPA's national board of directors She currently sits on the National Football League's Players Association's Financial Education Advisory Board, and she has been seen on NBC's Nightly News, CNN, NPR, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times. She is also the author of Sudden Money, Managing a Financial Windfall. Susan, thank you for taking time for this podcast. It's a pleasure to be with you, Jay. Thank you for your interest. Well, that's quite a background for sure. And you are very well known in financial advisory circles. So taking time to come on this podcast and share your story, I think is going to be very beneficial for the audience. In addition, behavioral finance is is widely accepted in the advisory community. You have a different take on it, and the framework at which you talk about the dark side centers around three questions. Would you mind walking us through this dynamic? Let's start with the first question. Well, yeah, there are, you know, let's back up for a second because I don't want to confuse anybody to think that there are three questions that illuminate the dark side, if you will. Um, if it's a dark side, there has to be a light side. And the light side is that we want clients to be really comfortable uh, and confident making the decisions that shape the life that they're going to live. And it's a, it's a huge responsibility. The problem is, is that we're not really trained in it. We see the problem and we find um, a range of solutions and we try them out. And in trying them out, we can stub our toe or or worse with clients we can really we can lose a client doing this so the three questions that we're talking about today are an entry uh level exercise to do with clients and i don't really mean entry from the advisor point of view i mean for the advisor to enter into a really deep meaningful conversation with their client and we look at it at the Institute, the Financial Transitionist Institute, as a way to start to get some anchoring around a big event that's happening in somebody's life. It could be a widow, it could be an inheritance, a sale of a business, retirement, those big events that advisors are trained to work with. They're confusing, they're overwhelming, and it's a classic time for people to make regrettable decisions. So the first question, I know this is a long uh, preamble to to answering your question, so uh, I hope that's okay, but the first question is saying to a client who's telling you something is happening, you're about to start to work with them, but you take a step back or a step to the side and you say, while we're doing this work, that's all important. You're going to be making decisions that you're going to live with for a long time. So before we get into doing all of that, 
let's just be clear. What is it in your life that needs to be protected? What is it in your life that's so important? We always have to work around that to make sure that part of your life is is okay, it's solid, it's being supported. So trying to find out what people hold sacred in their life gives both the client and the advisor a framework that's important. It's a reference point for all other decisions. Okay. So when you know what's important to them, then then it, it helps you give the right advice. Okay, so through your lens, that's the first question, is to get down to the core yeah. of what is sacred, what needs to be protected. Right. Okay. The surprise here, Jay, is that frequently what someone says is not what you would expect them to say. Could you give me an example based on your experience? Yeah, 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 yeah. They might be talking about a relationship, and it's a relationship you may be aware of, but you you wouldn't necessarily put it down as the number one thing. It could be something about their health. It could be something about their self-esteem, their identity. Um, it could be something about their, their finances and where they live, but it's not really what they say first. The, the, the art form here, the skill set, is to have a deeper conversation than just ask a question. And this is where we get to the dark side. When you ask a question like that, the potential for the client being able to um, discover in themselves what comes out and really explore with their advisor why, why that is important. What difference would it make if we really protected that aspect of your life? What difference would it make if we didn't? So there is a conversation that we have a, a, um, a scaffolding for so that the client feels safe, they feel heard, and you get to a deeper level than they would if it was just um, a quick question. And if you have a couple, they may have the similar answer in the beginning, but then as you really ask the questions, you may find some nuances or some dramatic differences. And all of that's okay. It's, it's getting to what is at the, the heart. What is, what is it that really people um, need to have um, safe in their life and protected? So, when you, when you know that, then you have the responsibility to be able to filter your use that as a filter for your advice and for your planning and for the exploration of, of discovering what, what next and, and how best to use um, all the aspects of this life transition event. So Susan, if you don't do Susan, that, may I interrupt if you ask you for and a don't second? do it, you're in trouble. Please, sorry. Okay. So Susan, let's go back to, to the framework of that question that requires a certain amount of empathy and i would imagine some skill sets that are needed for the advisor to open up that can of worms if you will how do you recommend advisors that typically don't go down that path execute on that it what it really takes is deep listening empathy is part of deep listening you're, you're right with that absolutely jay um it's patience it's training yourself to not be the expert with the answer for a question like that. The client's the expert. It's training yourself to let someone have some silence because in silence they tend to, they're, they're still thinking. And what happens with many advisors and, and all of us human beings is we get uncomfortable with silence. So when you're going to ask a question like that, Pacing really matters, and it's just being careful to ask the question, ask maybe an additional question, give plenty of room for someone to think about it. You don't want to turn it into an interrogation. They don't want to feel like they're being um, analyzed or you're taking them through therapy. So you have to make it relevant for them. But deep listening is different than active listening. Active listening, the client says, oh, this is important to me. Then you say, oh, so I hear this is important to you. Therefore, we're going to do that. That's kind of active listening. 
Deep listening is creating more space, listening for the uh, for what's not being said sometimes, or for some nuances. We actually, when we when we go through the certifying process, um, besides a, a, a one day exam, uh, people have to go through a deep listening exam. So we actually have that as part of the certification. A deep it, listening it, exam. What's involved with that? Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting. Um, they're in a, a simulated meeting with a, with a client, and there's someone who's acting out um, a client, and they have some complexities. It's, it might be um, someone who's retiring, but there may be a subtext of something with children or a pending divorce or an illness that's just lightly mentioned. So there's many things going on. And the um, the candidate for certification needs to listen, ask questions, and listen, and then explain what what they what they heard and what they would do. And there are three judges that are uh, watching this. Um, so we created the 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 rubric for this, um, like we do for so many other things with specialists in the field of testing. Um, and we're one of the few that that does this sort of thing, particularly in the finance area. Um, and it's it takes years to figure that kind of thing out. We've learned a lot along the way, but we also learned how uncomfortable it is for many advisors, great advisors, to really be quiet and actively, or excuse me, deeply listen to a client. We're so used to being experts. Mm-hmm. So I can tell you when uh, earlier in my career, I worked for Lehman Brothers, and they actually purchased a company that I worked for. And so I had already had about 10 years of sales experience, but they made us go through their sales training process. And my biggest takeaway from the whole experience is that they were radically focused on making sure that you did not speak more than a third of the time in conversations. Because the real value was in listening and letting them tell you what they needed as opposed to you being the expert talking about how smart you are. It's very impactful, and it sounds like this follows the same line. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that makes sense to me. Um, they say that the, uh, the PhDs in psychology and, and adherent behavior and all we have on faculty always, always tell us that advisors talk too much. <laughs> Yes, I can guarantee you that is the fact. That That is the case. All right, so I don't want to yeah. get too far off track. So the first question to, to frame a conversation is around figuring out what needs to be protected. What's the second question? Well, the second question is, uh, what do we need to let go of? And that's a tough question. When someone has been uh, widowed, um, that's an event that you don't look forward to, but maybe someone got married or someone is retiring or selling a business. Positive events um, have transitions as well as negative. And what people are uh, probably somewhat aware of, but they haven't really figured it out yet, what's not going to work? Things that used to work the way life was don't always translate and it may be housing, it may be relationships, it, it may be something with cash flow, um, it may be routines and commitments that they make. Um, and the answer to that frequently is, I haven't really thought about it, or I don't know, or there's one thing, but you sense that there's probably others. So again, it's a deep listening conversation, just wondering. It's not that you know, you're, you're wondering what they feel won't work. And if there is really no answer, I haven't thought about it, it's still too new, it's a heads up for the advisor to explain that we'll figure this out as we go along. And there's a process for that. And we'll, we'll see it. We'll do some scenarios. We'll have to make some adjustments here and there. Maybe it's uh, all new money and it's all great and there are new choices. So maybe it's getting you're, you're moving on from the old neighborhood and you're moving into something better. Uh, it isn't always a negative of letting go. Okay. And, and that, that sets somebody up to understand that this is a big change and there's, there are many moving parts. Okay. And to make sure listeners understand the framework for this, the, the Sudden Money Institute and the constructs of this conversation 
is framed around somebody who has come into mud, uh, money suddenly. And not just lottery winners, but you have inheritances, you have a widowed spouse, someone that's going through a life change in this framework that we're talking about is designed to help facilitate those conversations. Are there other examples that you could help listeners understand of where there is sudden money and they need to make sure that they identify what needs to be let go of? Well, you know, Jay, you're, you're really touching on an interesting point. Um, the term Sudden Money and Sudden Money Institute, that was, um, I was writing the book back in the late 90s, and my publisher, Wiley, just loved that name. We had come up with it or something. So, um, and, and it was what we were looking at back then, and we meant sudden increase as well as sudden decrease. We were talking about change that comes from a life change that comes from a financial change. So... Um, it, it's kind of a misnomer that it would be sudden. For for instance, retirement isn't usually sudden money. Your net worth doesn't change, but your liquidity and your responsibility and some of the dynamics around that change. So what we're really talking about is change. We say when money changes, life changes, and we advocate dealing with the life-changing side as your starting point and then get to the money-changing side, which is um, intuitively opposite for most advisors. Um, but this could be events where um, there's, a, there's a shift in responsibility. It could be one spouse uh, no longer can work or can no longer contribute one way or another or has some fairly expensive um, and time-demanding um, health care. Okay. That's a life transition right there. Um, and when life dynamics change, usually financial dynamics change with them. Um, so it, we're, we're trying to advocate that it's not just behavioral finances, understanding our, our cognitive biases, the biases of our clients. We look at money story. We look at many important aspects. But to really go into that space with a client, be present for them, and be willing to, to, to stay there with uncertainty. Um, there is more uncertain than certain when life is changing. Uh, in all the, the circumstances, whether you're an athlete with a new contract or you're, you just lost your job and you have to move the whole family across the country for a new job, there's all kinds of events there. But all that moving around and uncertainty is really part of the nature of change and, and transition. And advisors, if they can get the skill set for that, are really hands down the best professionals on the planet to help people um, navigate those big events. Once you've helped somebody navigate one big event, then you're the go-to for the next. And that's really what financial planning is all about, is helping people prepare for, manage, and adapt to change. Um, so it, it's, it's all kinds of events. It's the life side and it's the finance side. They're equally important, equally complex. Um, but I think as a profession, we take that personal side too lightly. We, we tend to go and get good information from psychology, neurology, sociology, all that. And we read the books and they're great authors, but we don't really put ourselves through the rigor of developing deep skills there. It's, it's experiential learning. You, we, we have people who have been with us for 20 years, and they'll tell you that they just keep learning. There's more and more and more to learn. Um, so when we talk about these three questions, I guess I felt like, geez, I, I don't want to make it so simple that you ask, you know, what do we need to protect? What do we need to let go of? And the third question is what new needs to be created? It's the skill set around using those three questions. All right. So let's use that as a transition into what what new needs to be created as the third question. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. Usually with uh, with any of the life events, there's there are some things that are new and sometimes they're fundamental. It could be routines. It could be responsibilities. It could be something with relationships. It could be someone reemerging from the way they saw themselves, their old identity, into a new identity. 
Um, it could be a new portfolio. It could be uh, a new tax position or charitable giving position. It could be everything above uh, or everything on that list. So what when you have this question, again, just like the second question, what do we need to let go of, um, most of the time at the beginning, it, people don't really know. Um, so they may have some ideas, so it's good to know those ideas, and it's good to then have that conversation and let them wonder about that. What what would new? You know, what what could we do here? What would be the best version of that? So what happens with these three questions, Jay, is that you have reframed this event. Um, I just got a, a big offer to sell my business, and I I took it. Now what? So rather than saying how much did you get and do you want to go here and do you want to go there and do you want to give money away, before you get into that, these three questions create a very strong framework that anchors you and and your client into what's really important to them and then gets both you and them ready for the other two dynamics of letting go and creating. And it could take you 15 minutes. It could take you a half an hour. It could take you five minutes. But if you can really be present for it and you can capture that and co-create at the end, say, this is, this is important stuff. This is what I'm going to write down in my file. Do I have this right? That final step there is uh, the client's opportunity to do some clarifying and it lets them know that you really heard them. And then you have to have it in your CRM so that you use it as a filter. Okay, excellent. So... To summarize the three questions to help drive the conversation, and more importantly, your opportunity to listen, are what needs to be protected, what do we need to let go of, and what needs to be created as a result of this transition. So could you tell listeners a little bit about the Certified Financial Transitionist designation? Yeah, thanks. Um, what we did is we created a um a 12 month program it's um six modules and there's a textbook and uh and on demand learning and all that you might expect when you go into these kinds of programs what makes this really different is this is experiential peer to peer learning so in each of those six modules they receive um tools and um, the explanation, the science behind it, the client-facing um, part and, and best practices and coaching tips. But then we want them to go and actually use that tool with a client. And that's where the real learning starts. And then we have experience calls with study groups where people can share their experience. And um, that's, you know, it's it's advisors love to learn from advisors. I think it's one of the highest and best ways to learn. So you have 12 months of doing this. Um, so you've learned um, the tools. You've probably made some fundamental shifts in your practice in how you do meetings, prepare for meetings, follow up meetings, give advice, give the work back to the, the clients because they have to do a lot of this thinking themselves. And then we have um, a one-day exam, um, and that includes listening. And then if someone has completed all of the experience assignments, they pass the exam. And if they have a qualifying um, primary designation, CFP, CFA, CDFA, uh, and a few others, um, then they're qualified to be a certified financial transitionist. We call it a CEFT. Excellent. So, Susan, I think you have uh, a couple of giveaways for listeners if they have interest in yeah. learning more about what we discussed here today. Yeah, yeah, that would be, uh, we'd welcome uh, interest uh, if people would like to hear more about those three questions. We have an overview that covers the tips and, and more tips on how to do that with your clients. You can keep it around as a cheat sheet. You can use it with your team to discuss preparation for a meeting, um, and, and you can use it with your clients. So we'd be happy to send that out. And uh, we also have, a, Jay, a new transition journal that it was created for the public, for a client or a prospect. And it it really is a great orientation 
to now that your life is changing, let's think through the stages and the truths and the the myths about transition and and how to make your best decisions and that sort of thing. And we'd like to give 10 of those away to the first 10 people. Um, it's a nice spiral brown um, journal that um, that's it's a good talking point if nothing else. But uh, it might actually get you a new client here and there, <laughs> which I'm sure listeners always like. So, Susan, how could they? Of course. How could they access this? Yeah, if they just write to us at info at suddenmoney dot com. Excellent. And Susan, how could listeners find out more about the Institute and your work? Thanks. Um, the uh, website and the training site for financial advisors is the financial is financialtransitionistinstitute.com. So if you if you Google me, you'll probably find that. The Sun Money site is an is a site now for the public. Financial transitionistinstitute.com um, and financial transitionists will bring you to us right away in a Google search um, and all the information is there and we start our 12 month courses core training uh, once a quarter the next one comes up in June and uh, we're, and we have live virtual trainings uh, so you could take a three hour virtual workshop in April if you wanted to learn more about it and see if this training was really for you Excellent. Susan, I will have links to all of that in our show notes, and I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thank you, Jay. It's been a pleasure.